Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm Julia Galef. I am the co-host of the Rationally Speaking podcast, uh, sponsored by the New York City Skeptics. Um, and it's my third year at town. I'm really excited to be back. Thank you. Um, my bio in the program is a little bit out of date. Uh, I moved up to Berkeley, California four months ago, and I'm now the president and co-founder of a new organization called the Center for Applied Rationality, or CIFAR for short. Um, we're developing a curricula, um, workshops, and uh, online material, teaching people not only about the science of rationality, what cognitive science knows about how humans reason and make decisions, um, but also training people to notice and correct for cognitive biases in their everyday life. Um, so I'll be tabling for the rest of the weekend, um, starting this afternoon. Please come by and, uh, and chat with me. Um, but now, we're going to be talking about a set of uh, exciting, um, possible future technologies, uh, all of which are either cutting edge or speculative or quack, uh, depending on who you ask. Um, and, and so we're going to be discussing and debating um, the extent to which optimism is warranted about those technologies. And we're going to touch on a number of things, including um, artificial intelligence, um, especially artificial general intelligence. Um, we're going to talk about uh, nanotechnology, so the, the manipulation of matter on the atomic or molecular scale. Um, and also about biotechnology and its, its applications to um, enhancing, dramatically enhancing our cognitive abilities and possibly dramatically extending our lives. Um, so that's a lot to cover. Um, but briefly before we start, I just want to say that I'm, I'm really pleased that there are uh, panels like this one at conferences, uh, at skeptic conferences in general, um, for two reasons. First, because I think that the, the task of predicting, oh, hi, Michael. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Um, the task of predicting the future is, uh, or, or just generally making, uh, uh, figuring out what to expect in terms of the development of various technologies is a really tricky one and, and it's a, a satisfyingly challenging question to cut our skeptical teeth on. Um, so even though I, I love a discussion of astrology as much as the next girl uh, at a skeptic conference, I also really relish the chance to tackle um, uh, tricky questions without obvious answers about what kinds of evidence is relevant when trying to predict the future. Um, should you be listening to the expert consensus or are the experts in that field biased? Should you be looking at past predictions and how successful they were? Um, should you be um, trying to extrapolate trends into the future and when is it legitimate to do that? These are really tricky questions and really interesting ones. And, and then the second and the main reason that I'm glad that there are panels like this occurring at skeptic conferences is that I think that uh, predicting what technologies are, are likely to pan out and, and how significant their impact is going to be, positive or negative, is one of the most high impact things that we can use our skeptic and, and critical thinking uh, tools to do. Um, human capital, money, time are, are some of our most valuable resources and um, if we don't think uh, critically and skeptically about where we should be directing those valuable resources, um, we're missing out on a huge opportunity. Um, and then the last thing that I will say before jumping into the panel is that in the interest of full disclosure, because one of our panelists is on the board of the Singularity Institute, I should mention that the Singularity Institute uh, has been providing seed funding to my new organization. Um, but I will also note that that fact has not in any way prevented me from having uh, very frequent and spirited arguments with the people at the Singularity Institute, which I'm sure any of them will uh, attest to if you talk to them. The so, rest of us will be extra mean to Michaels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, and we, so we have two Stevens and two Michaels on our panel today. So for the sake of clarity, um, this is going to be Steven and this Steve, and that's going to be Vassar and that Michael. We got that. Okay, let's, let's jump in. Um, I think I'd like to start off by discussing a um, uh, variety of technologies in the realm of life extension. Um, you might have heard the expression uh, from, from some more uh, techno-optimists in the realm of life extension technology that death is just an engineering problem. And there's no reason that we need to die when we do or really ever uh, if we can just figure out why death occurs and, and correct for it. Um, so I think I'll, I'll toss my first question over at Steve. Um, Steve, you've, you write an uh, amazing blog and are one of the leaders in evidence-based medicine. Um, do you have any sense of how promising any of the various life extension technologies or approaches are at this point? Uh, I, I, my short answer would be not very in terms of are we close to significantly extending uh, life span? I, mean, I do want to distinguish lifespan from life expectancy. You know, life expectancy is statistically how likely you are to live. Lifespan is what's the ultimate limit of our, uh, of our lifetime. Um, so while life expectancy has been increasing over the last couple of hundred years, lifespan is about the same 
you know, since caveman time, humans are humans. So we really are talking about making fundamental differences to our biology before we can really increase lifespan. And there's a lot of speculative ways about how, how we might do that. My sense is that we really just don't, we don't know. We don't have enough information right now to know which one of these things are gonna pan out. About the best we've done is extreme caloric uh, restriction definitely makes you know, mice and worms live longer. But we don't really know how that applies to people. Uh, you know, again, the theme here is that we're horrifically complicated. You know, there's, we don't know how many layers of, of depth of information we're, that we're still missing. Um, we often don't know, we know what correlates with aging, but we don't know what, what are markers for aging versus quote unquote causing aging. And we don't know what would happen, for example, if we extend telomeres, will that really make us live longer? Is that just something that happens to happen as we get older? Can so, you explain what telomeres yeah. are? Uh, telomeres are the, the caps at the ends of, D, of uh, chromosomes, and they get progressively shorter as we get older. Uh, the, the cells try to, to, to rejuvenate them, but, but eventually they get clipped, and uh, that could be an ultimate limitation on how long that cell could live. Um, but at the other end, to be, all right, so the optimistic end of the spectrum is there are creatures out there, not humans, but there are creatures that are essentially immortal. Cell lines can be immortal. There is no reason why that can't happen. So uh, I don't see any <laughs> ultimate reason why we can't get there. I just think we have no idea what it's going to take to get us from here to there. Um, and, and what about specifically the experiments that have been done on mice um, that, have, that have enabled mice to live um, a significant percentage longer than they naturally would? How, how much do you think that we can extrapolate from that about, about human perspective for like, life extension? Again, it's a massive unknown. You know, we obviously use mice a lot in research. We have mouse models for any disease we can make a mouse model for. Uh, and the, that, uh, the ability of those models to predict what happens in people is very problematic and very mixed. So you, you ultimately never really know how good your model is until you try the same thing in people. So uh, we, we, we hope that we're learning things that will apply to people, but we honestly we're not, you know, there's some reason to think that maybe there is some application, but then others research says, well, but they're different in this way, and that may be a deal killer in terms of applicability. So, so it's an open question how good the model is for human longevity. Um, is anyone on the panel significantly more or less optimistic than Steve about life extension? I would, I would say that I'm maybe more nuancedly optimistic than Steve in terms of this because when Steve says it's an unknown whether things are going to come out of research on mice or fruit flies or nematodes or whatever they happen to be researching in a particular lab, that is true. But scientists and especially engineers have developed ways of quantifying and thinking about unknowns in a rigorous manner. Now, there are always structural uncertainties in models. We can't be perfectly precise about it. And Talib, Nassim Talib has very famously complained that we underestimate the size and frequency of black swans, very extreme uh, deviations from model performance. But if we know that we underestimate black swans and when we're thinking about black swans, that's a reason to try to pay more attention to them. Uh, it, it kind of sounds to me like the implicit assumption behind saying that these things are simply unknown is that if things are not known, you should treat them as if they will not change over any given period. But if, while technological progress over the next century, say, might be highly unknown. Treating it, when thinking about the year 2100, it would seem fairly foolish to me to model it the with the same model that you would model 2020 with. Because while one can predict through extrapolation and looking at the development pathway roughly what will be around in 2020, you can't predict what would be around in 2100, but you can still be pretty sure that you need some way of representing in your model the fact that almost for sure things are going to be a lot more different in 100 years than in age. Mm -hmm. well, I, th I think fundamental to the question is what the definition of death is. So um, that's not something that's actually agreed on very well either. So, I mean, uh, clinically, death can be stopping the heart or stopping a breathing, but we've all heard stories about people who drown and, and are frozen or, or very chilled and they, they live extraordinary periods of time in that state and it could be resuscitated. Um, when, when I'm you know, looking at the brain of, of an animal at a microscopic level, 
what seems to correlate best with irreversible death is actually the synapses break between neurons. When you're recording from a neuron and, and seeing its connections between uh, another neuron, what happens when, when the animal dies, and when you know best that the animal's dead, even if their heart's still beating, is that the, the actual spines that connect one neuron to the other, they, they, they disconnect. And so one of the things that, that you know, that's my view of how, how this is happening, that, that, that it's not a very good definition of what it means to be irreversibly dead. And so we need to really focus on that question as well if we're going to understand what it means to extend life and what it is we're actually trying to accomplish, um, which is, I think, keeping that connectome together and information running through it seems to be fundamental to what life means for people. I'd, I'd like to expand briefly on what uh, Vassar started to allude to, which is this question of what, what is your sort of default assumption about what you should expect from technology if you're very uncertain about uh, how to solve a particular problem uh, like, like death. Um, and, and so uh, what Vassar was saying is that um, we tend to underestimate the uh, size of progression, um, uh, technological progression. Um, well, certainly long term. Certainly yeah. long term, yes. We um, underestimate black swans, extreme, we underestimate the number and severity of extreme deviations from the normal distribution. Right, um, and so I'd like to juxtapose that claim against the claim that uh, a number of other skeptics, including uh, Michael Shermer, have made about futurist predictions tending to uh, be wildly over-optimistic. Um, do uh, Vassar or, or Michael, do either of you uh, see a contradiction between those two claims? How would, how would you resolve them? Well, when it comes to ending death, I'm for it. <laughs> Absolutely. I think you guys are doing great. Keep working on it. <laughs> if you get there, let me know. Uh, the over-optimism part, I think, comes from, I guess, my general sense of having studied uh, apocalyptic prophets and so on is that the prophet always writes himself into the, the story as it's our generation and we're the ones that are going to do it. And, they ne and, and, and they're O for a lot <laughs> so far. So, uh, yes, of course, it'd be great if we could make it 2050 and then you live forever and all that. I, I just think it's more like, I don't think it's not impossible. I think you guys are probably on the right track, engineering problem. It's probably more like, you know, Star Trek, you know, time, 20, 2330 or 2530 or something like that. Unfortunately, I think I'm not even on the cusp, having been born in 54. You told me I, I'm right on the cusp. I might make it. So I've been working out extra hard. <laughs> I went on a low calorie diet once. <laughs> And uh, it started at breakfast and, and, and it ended at dinner. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> no, I, I have done low calorie diets. They're really hard to do. You're just in a constant state of hunger. And it's not pleasant. And so even if you could scale it out to the end of life where you, you get an extra six months or a year, I'm not sure it's worth the 30, 40 years of constantly being hungry. Uh, you know, all things in moderation um, is what I say on that. And, uh, and also having been uh, you know, a bike racer for you know, 30 years now, I've fo always followed the diets and nutrition and the latest whatever on, on supplements and all that stuff, and it's constantly changing. And that's discouraging to me. It's like if, if the science should be somewhat progressive, like we know for sure, for sure this works and so on, and it's always changing. It's always something completely different from before, which tells me they're probably not on the right track. Um, and so you just go back to that, that uh, moderation. So although I'm in favor, uh, that sort of the optimistic side of me likes Ray Kurzweil and the Singulitarians, and I think it's great you guys are doing this, and it's mostly private money anyway. Peter Diamandis is putting up X prizes. This is fabulous. And, and, and breakthroughs will come through. If they do, this is great. Um, but let's be realistic. Uh, and don't, don't forget to live now, because you know, 2030 may not happen for us. <laughs> I will toast that at the bacon party later. Yeah, the today. bacon party. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, bacon and donuts. Uh, right. Uh, also, just very quickly to interject, because I suspect many people in the audience might not know this, um, the Singularity University, which is run by Ray Kurzweil, is, is not connected to the Singularity Institute, which uh, Michael Vassar serves on the board of. Um, and they're not necessarily aligned in the, the things that they predict about the future and, and technology and AI. Um, so just to, to clarify, they're, they're two distinct things. Um, Oh, the other thing, uh, at the Singularity Summit I spoke at last fall, yeah. uh, when Ray Kurzweil gave, got up and gave his I have a dream speech, you know, we're this close to downloading brains and constructing a, you know, a computer uh, that's human level and so on. And then the next speaker was Christoph Koch from Caltech, who's a neuroscientist, and he puts up on the screen the wiring diagram for C. elegans flatworm. It's 302 neurons. 
He says, we know every neuron and every connection, and we still have no idea how this thing operates. And you're talking about 100 billion neurons. We're not that, you know, it's, it's like, a lot, we're a long ways from that, I think. Well, I certainly don't think that we're very close. I know people who are currently mapping out the input output diagrams for the neurons in C. elegans. I'm, you know, tracking that. There's funding for different neuro or optogenetics techniques for extra extracting that information. Um, I, have a pr I think I have a pretty clear idea of how you can extrapolate things, assuming another 10 years of Moore's Law, another 20, another 30, another 40, assuming similar improvements algorithmically. Uh, Vassar, can you just explain what Moore's Law is in case people don't know? There's a general long-term trend where computing power doubles every roughly 12 to 24 months. That's a uh, big deal in the long term because rapid exponential growth leads to really large long-term changes. So computers today are roughly a million times more pro powerful in terms of floating point operations per second than computers 30 years ago. That sort of extrapolation you can put back another 30 years. Putting it forward another 20 years doesn't seem that implaus implausible and that gives you a lot of details about what you should and shouldn't be able to do. A lot of our thinking comes from things like that. Um, it's not really wild-eyed speculation. It's based on, you know, what does any, what do people have to be predicting implicitly for the economic calculations to make any sense? You know, assuming that things do not suddenly all freeze technologically, but continue something like the last 20 years, what does that look like? And then what technological capacities become feasible at what new levels of computing power, et cetera? So if you were going to map out a nematode brain with today's computing power, how long do you need for a human brain? If the nematode is one, you know, 300 neurons versus 30 billion, is one 100 millionth the size of the human brain? Well, how valuable is a simulated human brain? Can you compress things further once you've studied it for a while? You know, these, there are fairly obvious questions that you can work out, and then you can try to work out what the answers probably are. But so it, it, it's not as easy as, as just saying a nematode it has 302 neurons and humans have several orders of magnitude more, so we just have to extrapolate several orders of magnitude. A nematode is visible. We, so so in, the, in the case of transistors and Moore's Law, from the very beginning when they invented the transistor, they knew what they were trying to do to make a circuit. So we understood what we were trying to do 30 years ago to get where we are now, and it was a matter of the, uh, the technology for putting more and more transistors onto a chip, and, and so there, there was no mystery as to what, we're, what we want to do. With, in terms of discovering how the, how the brain leads to consciousness that you could then download, we have no idea how, how you can take a bunch of inanimate neurons and hook them up into a circuit that then becomes conscious. So it's a completely different problem and even then with nematodes, we have the microscopy methods to see the entire nematode at the same time so that we can determine those connections. But that's it. We, don't, we can't just take that same technology and apply it to humans because we can only see with microscopy neurons down to about one millimeter into the brain. So with a, with a C. elegans, that's fine. But with a human, it's basically there is no technology that can accomplish what needs to be done to solve even the, the connections between the neurons that we see in C. elegans. So it's, it's a much bigger, different problem um, where a lot more different things have to be discovered before we can move forward in that. And Stephen, your lab uh, focuses on neurophysiology, so the, the, the correlate, neural correlates, like what is actually precisely happening in the brain when, uh, when you focus your, your vision on a particular object or, or perceive color and so on. Um, that seems, correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems to be an area in which we, we have achieved a lot of understanding uh, of what's going on, what the brain is doing. Um, how much do you think that we can extrapolate from that into sort of higher order processing? Are there similar algorithms that are being run at different levels, or do we just have no idea? Yes, so, so we know that, that different parts of the brain, um, especially the cortex of the brain, have very similar circuits. And so when we study a circuit in the visual cortex, and we understand how the neurons connect together to, to, to process a certain type of perception, we more or less can extrapolate to how that would work in audition. It's just different types of inputs from a different sensory organ. And, and in fact, you can, experiments have shown you can take one piece of cortex and swap it with the other from completely different parts of the brain. 
and the animal can actually perceive the correct thing. So that with a piece of auditory cortex put into the visual uh, part of the brain, or the piece of auditory brain put into the visual part of the brain, that animal can actually see with it. And uh, so, so these experiments are happening and the circuits are more or less the same. So yes, we can find out what the circuits are and, and extrapolate to other parts of the brain, including cognition, because the cognition is processed with the same type of circuits in cortex, which looks the same everywhere. So yes, we can do that. I, I believe that a lot of uh, Ray Kurzweil's optimism about when we will understand uh, human consciousness cognition well enough to replicate it uh, on a computer comes from this assumption that uh, there's just a few algorithms that the brain is running at all these different levels, um, so that once we've understood them on the lower level, we can just extrapolate up. Um, but, but Kurzweil has a prediction of within, I think, the next 20 to 25 years uh, about understanding human uh, cognition well enough to build it. Uh, if you had to uh, make your own prediction, what would, you, what would you expect to see? I agree with Kurzweil in the sense that, that a lot of what we are and a lot of our behavior and perception and experience of the world is built up from fairly simple algorithms. I mean, there's only 20,000 genes in the genome. It's, it's unreasonable to think there's more than 20,000 circuits in the brain. So that means that we're, when I was a graduate student, the sky was the limit. There were millions of circuits in the brain. We had no idea how many. Now we know there really can't be more than 20,000, and it's presumably much fewer than that because some of those genes are needed for what shape your teeth are and how tall you are and things like that. that, that you know, you've got definitely 1,300 genes in your body dedicated to your olfactory receptors and nothing else. So there's many fewer uh, circuits than, than we originally thought, and it could be in the hundreds or, or maybe even less, and everything has to be built out of that. So that's true. But then taking that knowledge about how you could build a brain and saying that I'm going to take your brain and I'm going to replicate, I'm going to find out all those connections and maintain the unis of you and put that in a computer and simulate it, that's a completely different issue. You have to be able to detect all the connections in your brain that makes you different from you. Mm -hmm. And that's not, that's not something we have the knowledge of how to do right now. Um, so right. so uh, we should distinguish between building a human level uh, general intelligence in a computer from uploading, which is taking a, a current consciousness, one of you, and putting it onto a computer such that uh, personal identity is, is maintained for whatever definition you're using. I think um, there's a problem with that in itself, the personal identity problem. So let, let, you say you do have a problem? I think there's a problem there's there. A problem, yeah, yes. I, unless I'm misunderstanding this, here, here's how it goes. Let's say we now have the capacity to clone your body and upload your mind onto a computer, and you you do the uh, hard drive um, up, uh, the hard drive upload every backup every week. You know, like you're supposed to do with your time machine on your Apple. It reminds you. Don't forget to upload. Uh, you know, back up your hard drive. Okay, so you do this, and you go on a trip, and the plane goes down, and the word gets back to your spouse. You know, your, your spouse has died in this, in this plane crash. No problem. You know, your spouse calls the cloning thing, and they rebuild the body, and then they call the, the backup hard drive company, and they upload that, and, 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 and then you, and you go home. And there you are. But there's been a mistake. The plane did not go down. The pilot pulled it out at the last minute. And, and so you go home, and there's somebody else in you know, bed with your spouse. You're going, hey, wait a minute. That, that's not me. That's just a copy of me. So who's the real you? The real you, I don't see how it can possibly be you. You would not consciously be thinking, hey, I'm still alive. This is me. I'm still here in the computer. You would not be. Either that or there's more than one of you thinking that those exact same thoughts. I, I don't see how, without a, the, without a continuity of just you and your own brain continuously conscious, how being dead and then, then waking up again in a computer, I don't think that can happen. That's Unless the, I'm yes, just reading this. That's the continuity problem. Yeah. I don't know of any solution to that. I don't we either. We spend the rest of the panel talking about that. But you know, just to, uh, to put my you know, two cents in on that, that issue, there's a few different ways that we can you know, uh, reproduce a brain with artificial intelligence or whatever. And, and the processes I, th I see are happening in parallel uh, with researchers. One is sort of the top-down method of understanding the circuits and then reproducing them. I think we're farthest away from that because the complexity is incredible, and even if the number of unit circuits isn't that good, there's different than layers of, you know, when you combine them together, then you can de you multiply the, the, uh, the complexity, um, and we don't know what we don't know. So there's still enough going on there. We know a lot, 
but the, we, we know enough to know that the, what we don't know is still vast and, and unknown. So that, I, I don't know that we can predict when that's gonna happen. I think that's probably gonna happen last of all the ways to reproduce a neural circuit or an artificial brain. Um, another way to do that is that rather than trying to understand everything top down is just to reproduce it virtually or in a computer, just you know, map out the circuits and put them together and see what happens. That, that is happening at a reasonable pace and again, it's always hard to extrapolate. You can't extrapolate linearly. It's, you, it, you get into problems there. there. But there's no question, I think, that computers are going to be powerful enough in 30 or 40 years, and the, we're making a lot of progress in just you know, modeling uh, the circuits, even if we don't understand them exactly. Uh, it's, it's possible we'll be able to create a virtual or an artificial brain that we don't understand, and that will function. It seems that when we do create a virtual circuit that mimics a circuit in a rat or a mouse or whatever, it functions. It does what it's supposed to do. It's, it's an actual working circuit. So I think that when we actually make a virtual brain, it'll function. It may even be conscious, which is really weird to think about. And then the third way is to grow it. So we don't necessarily need to know how to put all the pieces together. Is we just need to know the, the developmental algorithms that will make all the pieces assemble into the final product. Actually, I do disagree with Stephen a little bit about the, the uh, number of circuits in the brain, because my understanding was always that, yes, there's not that many genes, ultimately, that, that control the development of the brain, but there could be orders, there could be lots more complexity in the, that comes into the picture in the developmental process. So the, you know, the, the genes are not a, a cookbook, it's a, or a blueprint, rather. It's, it's just a, a, an algorithm for how the brain will develop, will unfold, and you get increasing complexity in that process. So there actually may be more circuits than genes. That was always my understanding. Do you disagree with that? Yeah, there can't be more circuits than genes, but there can be many different orders of magnitude of slightly different circuits in different people. Permutations of Absolutely. Of circuits, yeah. so, so that definitely can be true. Um, but I don't, I don't think there can be more, more different okay. circuits than genes based on the but those are the three things we're talking about, and they're happening in parallel, uh, and we, they're feeding off each other too, and it's cool and unpredictable at what's gonna happen. <laughs> and uh, what, what do you think about the argument that we have this proof of concept that it's possible to build a brain as, as intelligent as a human, because here we are, um, and it took evolution X number of years to, uh, to produce the human brain, and we can iterate at a much faster rate than evolution, especially as computers get, uh, get more and more powerful. Um, so that should give us uh, significant optimism about our ability to hit on the right strategy to building a, a human-level intelligent brain um, in the near future. What do you think of the logic of that? I'm tossing this out there to anyone. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I think you know, once, uh, there's no magical limit about human-level intelligence. It's just our level of intelligence, so we're obsessed with it, but, and it's what we know. But if we can get to human level intelligence, there's no reason why we can't blow right on past human level intelligence. And obviously it's gonna happen much faster than evolution because the technological evolution happens at you know, orders of magnitude more quickly. It's a different process. Uh, so you know, I, again, I, I don't know of any argument or reason why that's, you know, that that's not going to happen. We're going to develop you know, super human intelligence. Once we get in the groove, so that's the other thing. When you talk about extrapolating technology to the future, and I think Moore's law is a great example of this. And this is I think, another thing that's, it's the predictability is unpredictable in that w we find ourselves, like we hit upon an idea like the circuit and the integrated circuit. And then that idea has this amazing potential and that we run with that for decades or whatever and you know, once we're in that groove, we can predict how that line of technology is going to develop. And as long as Moore's law holds, we can pretty much know what's going to happen. But we can't predict when we're going to run up against roadblocks. And we, you know, sometimes you can see them coming because of physics. Uh, but there may be other things that come into play. And you can't predict when you're going to get into that groove. So in other words, there are game changers. And that's always the fly in the ointment of predicting the future, is we, we, can, we can sort of extrapolate the grooves that we're in, what we know, but there's always these game changers, these black swans or whatever, that co are completely changing the rules on us. And that's why people 50 years ago, nobody, all the people that were thinking about the future about this this year, you know, this this era that we're living in, nobody got it right. Nobody was close to the kind of things that we're doing today. All the things that they thought we would have, we don't, and all the things that are really cool and technological that we do have, we're completely not even on the radar 
of the futurists from 50 or 60 years ago. Um, even people that would spend a lot of time thinking about it. And I think we just have to assume that that's going to be pretty much true. Once you get beyond like the five to 10 years of playing out current technology, you, hmm. you don't know what game changers are going to completely alter the equation. So you just don't know. So the very fact that we're talking about AI now means it's probably not going to happen. Well, just I think <laughs> broad, <laughs> broad brush strokes, I think, you, yeah, so the, the, the really broad brush strokes, I think you can say, um, are like, you know, you could say what's likely or what's not likely. It, when you get down to like applications, how people are going to interact with technology, you know, how, you know um, exactly how what it's going to play in our civilization, though that's very, very, I think, hard to predict. So, uh, and you know, when you say artificial intelligence, it, 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 we don't know, it may be that we might get to the point where it's a lot easier than we think, that, you know, 10 years from now, somebody's got a model of a brain in the computer and it starts talking to them, you know, who knows? Or we might get to the point where we, you know, we're looking back and say, why shouldn't we have had artificial intelligence for 50 years? What happened? You know, why, what are we missing? What, why didn't this happen? Why don't we have flying cars? You know, we, they, that may be the question 100 years now. Why don't we have artificial intelligence? I don't think that's going to happen, but you, again, you don't, you don't know. We don't know what roadblocks are going to be there because you don't know what you don't know. Um, I, on, another issue here is that there's a, we have to draw a distinction between developing artificial intelligence and replicating human intelligence artificially. <coughs> Yeah. So um, there, there may be uh, algorithms that can be developed that are just as good or maybe even better than human intelligence that you could do in computers. But in terms of determining the discovery of how humans actually do it, that's a biological question that requires a completely different set of techniques to get at. Mm -hmm. And it's not just an idea of, of thinking of the algorithms and implementing them and see if they work and then they kind of help you along and, and you move forward. There's lots of artificial intelligence um, uh, circuits that are used in products today that have nothing to do with what the human does. Mm -hmm. And so um, the idea that we're going to replicate ourselves and be able to download our brain into a machine that can then be us is, is what really I have a, a, a no confidence that we're ever going to be able to do in, in, in our lifetimes, certainly. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, uh, in terms of developing artificial intelligence where you can actually have a human-like creature that is made completely artificially, that's a different issue. And that's just going to depend on the discovery of what intelligence is, which again, we're still not clear on. We still don't know most of the circuits in the brain and how they connect to each other. And all of that stuff has to happen from a biological level if we're going to replicate humans, or from a computer science level if we're just going to say humans are irrelevant and we just need to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. I agree. I don't think that the uploading or downloading, uh, what, direct, what direction does it go? Do you upload your brain or download your brain? I don't think that that's ever going to really be a great idea. There's the continuity problem, which I have a huge problem with as well. And there's the, the problem of how do you, is it going to be my brain as opposed to just a brain? Uh, but there are, you could imagine other things that we could do that might still kind of get us there. So like, for example, you could imagine a, an artificially intelligent brain that is connected to your brain and they symbiotically exist and then over 10 or 20 years they essentially become one unified consciousness to the point where the biological component becomes unimportant and you basically are the artificial brain so that's a, a there's you know that that kind of thing may solve the continuity problem, may eventually get you to the point where you are a computer brain without having to do the sort of instant upload or download problem I'd be a little more optimistic if we just could make some incremental steps like Alzheimer's and senility. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we've made practically no progress on this. If neuroscience is doing so great and we're just you know, ready for the black spot, how come we can't even solve this? I would disagree with that, but you know, it's one, I wouldn't say no progress, but it's, it's the, the kind of progress that is happening in the background and hasn't crossed the threshold to a clinical application right. yet. But if you talk to people who are doing Alzheimer's research, we're learning a ton about what is going on and in brains that are suffering from Alzheimer's disease, you know, and, and in, including completely new ways of thinking about the problem, like, oh, it's really a protein folding problem. That's a totally new idea that sort of right. did not exist five years ago with Alzheimer's research. So, but, you know, having, translating that into a treatment for or whatever, a cure for Alzheimer's is, we're, we don't know what, when that's going to happen, because we don't know, because again, like five years ago, nobody was talking about protein folding. They thought that they were on to the real cause of the problem. And then the, now they're thinking, oh, maybe it's a layer deeper, and this is just 
the manifestation of this deeper problem. Now, right now we know what the real problem is. But of course, it may still just be one layer deeper still, but we're still making progress. You don't know when you're going to hit the treasure chest, right? You keep digging and digging and digging. You don't really know when you're going to hit the answer, but you're still making progress. You're still digging. So that, I wouldn't characterize it as no progress. I'm sorry, I forgot. Could you repeat that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I want that drug from that movie. You take it, it makes you hyper intelligent and super <laughs> fast and smart. Limitless. Yeah. So, so, so Stephen. Yeah. If you talk about there being a lot of game changers, then yeah. it's hard to predict. But as far Mike. as so Stephen, you talk about there being a lot of game changers. I'm that, Steve. He's Steve. Oh, sorry, Steve. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that make things hard to predict, and certainly game changers do make things hard to predict. Yeah. But as far as I can tell, aren't all game changers new, unexpected capacities? I mean, when we've run into, in the past, limitations in the laws of physics that were not expected, they've been silly limitations that are so far away from practical relevance that it's not even funny? Well, I think yes and no. I mean, I, th I think you're thinking of new ideas and new paradigms that do give us, as you say, new capacities, but there's also roadblocks. So let me give you an example. In 1990s, you were talking to researchers, they were saying, yeah, you know, in the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to basically cure all genetic disease. We're going to have retroviruses go in there, swap out the genes, they're going to all be cured. We haven't cured a single one yet. We're 20 years later because we ran into technological problems that, that, we, that we have not been able to work our way around. So that made it difficult to predict that. And so I think there are, there are limitations and there are uh, technological problems that you can't predict either until you actually try to do it. And so um, I think you have to think of it in terms of new capacities and roadblocks as two types of game changers. Actually, I think that this is just a difference in who we think of as the experts. You always have talking heads who, yeah. tr who treat current research as if it led immediately to fantastic future applications, whether people are talking about invisibility cloaks right. as their summary of physics research on optics every time you hear yeah. about physics right. research on optics, to people who talk about how any given research into the structure of the ribosome could cure cancer and the right. common cold. But the, if one tries to do one's futurism by listening to the hype cycle and predicting that every breakthrough that is hyped for 10 years out is going to happen in 10 years, well, obviously not. Yeah, but I, if you try I, to talk I, to I the agree. experts in the field and get a sense of the deeper issues underneath the hype cycle, and then try to build something like an expert consensus among the top experts in the field, and then maybe you double the time horizon and have the probability, I find that that works fairly well. So if people say, yeah, it's probably going to happen, that means it might happen. Say, translate probably into 60%, and then right. divide by two, 30%, take 20 years. I'm just trying to you know, ad lib this based on about 15 years of trying really hard to no, make sense of past predictions. I, that's a good rule of thumb. I like that. You double the time and have the prediction. That's probably good. I agree. And we, we talk about the hype all the time on our show. The exact same examples that you bring up. But with the, the retroviral thing, we were talking about people who were researching clinical applications. These were the experts in the field. They really thought that this was the answer. And it just turned out that there were technical problems. They actually ended up killing the people they were trying to treat. That they Whoops. then said, OK, well, we'll work our way around that. And then they just couldn't figure out how to do that. So, um, it, it, but, so it's not just hype. I agree with your assessment of the hype. But there are other real roadblocks that are unexpected that fool even the experts in the field who are not overhyping. Uh, before we go into questions, I just want to make sure that we have time to touch on nanotechnology. Um, I, I assume not all of you have expertise in all of these uh, potential technologies, but Vassar, I know I've heard you speak before about the potential promise for the field of, of nanotechnology. Um, what, is your, what, have you, what is your sense of the state of the field and, and its promise? All right. Well, nanotechnology can mean two very different things. There's the 1980s vision of Eric Drexler for molecular-based machinery. And then there's the uh, 1990s funded by National Nanotechnology Initiative stuff having to do with controlling the fine grained structure of matter and enabling things like faster uh, charging and discharging of batteries, uh, more efficient power transmission and energy storage, uh, things like phased array optics uh, for <coughs> displays. There's uh, all sorts of things that are developed through essentially understanding how properties emerge out of the low level but not molecular scale properties of materials and how the molecular scale properties emerge out of uh, the sequences of foldomers. This is a term for folding structural proteins. But, um, and in addition to both of these visions, the Drexler vision and the 
professional vision. There are the misstatements and vague popularizations of Drexler's vision. And of course, for his vision, you have like his ideas in 1978, which are basically what we call synthetic biology now. His ideas in 1987, which are basically a somewhat more serious version of the cartoon version. And then his ideas in 1997, which are pretty in line to what the expert professionals would think today, except being a little, pushing the envelope further in terms of how far out you're trying to look, how try, far out you're trying to think, and focusing maybe too much on uh, industrial capacity when thinking about a world 30 years out where industrial capacity is unlikely to be an important constraint. Uh, well, what do you think is the most uh, exciting thing that you think it's plausible we will be able to do with nanotechnology, say in the next 60 years? 60 is pretty much forever, and I expect we're talking about fine-grained structural control of matter. So let's talk maybe 10. Right, and when ten. we're talking 10 years, well, the old idea of growing diamond is kind of neat, and that's been moving along exponentially at a nice clip. Uh, there might be a lot of useful applications in semiconductor, as semiconductors, as structural materials, etc. cetera, to diamond. Um, we have uh, better ultracapacitors for rapid charge discharge that might allow things like really good regenerative braking, simple modifications to uh, old cars to produce things with way more electric power and efficiency. Um, nanotechnology applications going a little bit farther out. You have Actually, let like me interrupt nanotube. you very briefly. Um, for the last 10 minutes, I'm going to take questions. You can start uh, assembling. I don't know how you've been doing it. I think George will take care of that. But we'll get that rolling, sorry, while you finish your answer, Vassar. Anyway, the real important applications are things like carbon nanotubes and uh, self-assembling molecular chemistry solutions that get past the limits of current techniques for microprocessor fabrication. Because for the last 40 years, GDP growth, technological development, the basic logic of the economy have all been deeply dependent on these exponential increases in microprocessor fabrication and we're not going to be able to push current techniques more than 20 years out. That's really kind of pushing it. Uh, hopefully we can develop better ways of building 3D structures by that time and keep this sort of economic engine moving. Great, okay, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Take it away, George. No. One, two, no, no, no. There we go. Hey. Sorry about that. Okay, first question. Come on up here. Hi. So, um, Two of you mentioned that you had huge problems with the continuity problem, and I'm wondering why, assuming the technology exists, why would that situation that you described with the, the plane be different from somebody uh, suddenly fainting or being hit in the head or maybe just even going to sleep and then waking up without having the conscious perception of continuity? No, I think we, we're, I get that question a lot. Like when you go to sleep, you lose continuity. But no, but there is no. That's not true though, because your brain is still functioning. There is continuity. You're just tra transitioning from one state to another state. But but there is but there is still conti neurological continuity. It's different than you know making a copy or being destroyed and recreated or whatever. So I don't think there's an analogy there. Even when you're in a deep coma, there's still stuff happening in your brain, and there's still continuity. It's just a different state of consciousness that you're in. The only way I think it, it could work would be uh, if you had, is this working? Yes? No? I don't know. Uh, if you had, um, if you replaced every neuron with a synthetic neuron that was built by nanobots or something like that, such that you never actually lost consciousness and the continuity continued, and then you were no longer just an electric protein machine, it was silicon or whatever. That, that's the only way I think the, the yeah, continuity I don't like that one work. either. Because I'm, I'm worried that that's just a slow process of replacing you rather than a sudden process, but it's still in the end. I, so I, I think, you know, you, I like the idea of the, the symbiote where you're just, you know, over time um, it becomes you. So I think that's probably the right. best solution that I could think of. I, but, but I've heard that one a lot, you know, the slowly replacing neuron by neuron. Maybe that would work. I'm still a little, you know, you know I don't know, I'm not happy with that one. 
for the for the record, I don't believe there's a continuity problem. <laughs> I think that that when you watch a movie and you're immersed in it and you're and you're seeing this this other story or you're uh, you're dreaming uh, in your sleep that you fundamentally have changed what you're perceiving and that 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 humans are just adept at changing between one one experience and the other and you know while we're daydreaming some, some of you right now are daydreaming and uh, maybe m many of you and uh, that you'll come back to it and realize oh you're here at TAM and uh, you were just dreaming about your children's uh, birthday party or whatever it was and uh, that there's fundamentally no continuity problem if you change if you made a computer simulation of what's in my brain right now, that computer would think it was Steve Macknick sitting here in TAM having a great discussion about the future, even though it's running in China somewhere. And uh, that's what it would think. That's the continuity it would have. And, and it would have its memories of my entire life, etc. So if you made a clone of me and downloaded me into it, that would be that. I don't think that that's you know, necessarily possible, but... but the, that so there could be two of you in my thought experiment. In my thought experiment, there would be two of you then. There would be two, there'd be two of me, to, one of which would... I'm sorry to interrupt, but as Steve said, we could talk about the continuity problem for an entire panel, and I want to make sure we get a few more questions. Who's next? So, quick question. Hypothetically speaking, if the technology were there, would any of you be transported, beamed up, broken apart, put back together? I think that I'm with the technology Dr. Technology I did not cover. I'm with Dr. McCoy on that. Don't mm. scramble my atoms and send them all over the universe. <laughs> I think like most people, I'll probably be conformist and do what's socially acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. You really admire your outside view of yourself. Huh? The question is do you have to go through TSA first? <laughs> <laughs> I take the shuttle. You take the shuttle, yeah. yes. I would take the shuttle. <laughs> Uh, hello, I just wanted to ask, Steve, you mentioned one of the approaches would be just kind of putting something synthetic together and then seeing what happened. Um, I wondered if you guys could discuss maybe some ethical concerns about that because we do have the worst case scenario in a science fiction like Skynet. I mean, what if it did evolve to a point where it, we surpassed our own intelligence and then it turned on us kind of a thing? The so. inevitable robot uprising. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, actually, Michael Vassar was on my show. We talked for like an hour about this, right? I mean, it was, yeah. that's a, it's a huge problem. Is it, is it unavoidable, and how can we make it not unavoidable? Uh, so we did, I don't think we came to any firm conclusion. <laughs> so the answer is to be nice to your robots. <laughs> actually, that won't work, but, you know, you can try it anyway if you find it fun. Yeah, some one solution might be that we will be the robots. You know, we're not going to make robots or just make robots, but we will be them. That's Kurzweil's solution. That it's okay because we'll be evolving along with them, and that'll be sort of just part of what we become. And there won't be this sharp line of distinction of robots and humans. So that may solve the problem. I don't know. Thanks. It actually looks like a pretty hard problem. Someone's got to yeah. solve it. Yeah. <laughs> no one seems to be trying very hard, except for a very, very small number of people. Do you think we'll be able to get science fiction style artificial intelligence, those algorithms, without being able to understand how those biological algorithms work in the human brain? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I mean, two of the things that can get us there, one is to just, just duplicate it virtually without necessarily understanding it, and the other one is to grow it in some way, which could be like a, an evolutionary algorithm or a developmental <laughs> algorithm where we make the algorithm, but, we do, but the end result is something we don't fully understand. <coughs> So though if you use those methods, we very well may have an artificial intelligence we don't understand. I agree. I don't think there's any reason to think that biological material is, is special or that the algorithms that humans actually have are necessarily the only algorithms or even the best algorithms you could use. I agree with Steve completely. One or two more? Uh, I'm wondering your thoughts on uh, what are some of the problems or, or dangers of this technology and how we might deal with them, uh, particularly relating to this idea of sort of beating death or solving uh, de degeneration. Uh, like, do we risk uh, possibly stagnating because we aren't bringing in new minds? Yeah. Idiocracy, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, so what are the ethical problems that will be created by immortality? It'd be nice if we find out, you know. <laughs> let's just do it and then we'll worry about those problems when we get there. I'll we'll talk you know. later. Yeah, we'll talk. 
I, I don't think it, it's fun. Fun science fiction to speculate about that—the world of immortals. <laughs> But uh, you know, I, I don't think we're gonna have to worry about that anytime soon. But it's interesting. I don't, I don't have any special insight for you, unfortunately. I mean, if the population were to double every 70 years, like it's do doing right now, the Earth would still have an awful lot of empty space in 300 years. But not 400. No, not 400. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do, we'll do one more, one more. So I had kind of more on the computer side question. You said that we could not evolve current techniques with development of semiconductors and everything 20 years into the future, and I'm thinking it looks more like five years into the future before we can, because optical techniques will run out. So do you think we're going to finally hit the end of Moore's Law, we're gonna flatten out, and we're gonna have to make a major leap to move forward? Well, I know that people have different standards for what counts as on track, but the standard roadmaps tend to go about 10 to 15 years out. and. The, tra you know, the track record has always been that they get extended. So it seems unlikely that they won't be extended at all. One could imagine them phasing out gradually. So you know, at the end of this 10 or 15 year period, they're only able to see pretty clearly five to 10 years out. And then after that, another two or three years out, and then it's pretty much done. But you know, just looking at these things, they don't stop abruptly, because there, there's a lot of all sorts of small incremental improvements. They don't start abruptly. They don't stop abruptly. And the economic logic of it dictates that even if Moore's Law were to slow down somewhat, this would simply lead to more capitalization in computers, because computers would then no longer be as rapidly perishable as stock. So that gives you another five to 10 years of buffer. So I think we can get, have a pretty good idea looking out about 20 years, and then looking out about 30, it's getting a little bit sketchy. Looking out 40, it's really sketchy. All right, uh, please join me in thanking our, our panelists.